the finish, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. There is a poster session, so people uh, can do, remain here or watch posters. So up to you. Please, Dimitar, follow. How does it work? I get problems with microphone. Excuse me. Oh. oh, very simple. Thank you very much. Thanks. To continue? Thank you. Let's continue. After actually the destroying uh, the first set of the experiments, uh, I decided uh, that the temperature to be decreased. And as a matter of fact, uh, you can see here this actually temperatures, temperature intervals, where actually, generally speaking, initial temperatures of the specimen will proceed simply, they correspond to certain uh, uh, electrical power. So now, we modified the reactor chamber here. We installed here a tube, and again, we used exactly the same specimen, constant wire, coiled around alumina rod and AC voltage supply. With optical spectrometer initially and after it with pyrometer, we used to measure the temperature. By optical spectrometer, initial temperature was determined using the Planck's law. So now, it is the view of the reactor tube. There is a gate here connecting the reactor tube with uh, the main chamber. The gas injection was in the main chamber and the, reactor, uh, the, the gate was open during the experiments. Here we see the pyrometer over the window here watching the specimen having this kind of view. We can see here coiled constant wire on alumina rod, initially. Here, the corresponding electrical supply was provided. So now, we're going to see a video clip. As a matter of fact, before interaction, we are going to see something like that, through the window, through the window. We can see here the coiled constant on wire around the alumina bolt. In the before experiment, that the temperature was about, even visually can be determined to be about uh, 680, 700 degrees. And the rod is not visible. There is no glow in the chamber. During the experiment and immediate after interaction, we can see glow the temperature of the wire corresponding to the, the brightness was about 1,000 visually and the alumina rod was visible. So now, we are going to see two video clips. One actually, it is actually measures temperature of the specimen, 520 degrees C, which corresponds to the optically determined temperature of the constant on wire, 666 C, degrees C, by using of the Planck's law. Because actually this temperature corresponds to the, to the temperature of the entire specimen, not exactly the constant on wire. The comments about the temperature in the video clip number two will be based on the pyrometer showing. But after that, you are going to see what happens regarding actually the constant on, the, the temperature of the constant on wire. Okay, so now. Let me, uh, I would like we to start uh, the video clips now. One video clip is attractive without precise measurements.
you can see here now initially the wire going around the room road already there is injection with even gas giving room temperature the initial temperature of the wire is 60 660 degrees but I will appreciate if you increase the voice again excuse me uh, you need to increase the voice again because actually I would like to show something else now the temperature increases the brightness of the wire increases and there is a glow here in the tube okay the pyrometer is here, after that you are going to see during the second video clip well, what happens. Now there is stabilization of the brightness of the wire, the temperature increases. It is, it is, the temperature now is much higher in comparison with the temperature of the initial temperature. And there is a glow in the tube. You can see now some noise like chick 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 chick. It comes from the Geiger Mueller counter, registering, monitoring the gamma rays. Now, we are going to see shortly what happens, what will happen when actually the utility gas stops now. Maybe now, I don't uh, uh, know. About 1 minute and 30 seconds after the beginning of the experiment, yes. Uh, can we move again a little bit the back because actually it will be interesting. I see the uh, on the screen here. No, no, we'll turn a little bit back on the same video. Something like that, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So now we are going to see. You see now significant increase of the glow in the main chamber when actually the deuterium gas stops, which means cooling stops also, and deuterium gas doesn't cool the specimen. That's why the temperature actually used to rise. Now, because there is no deuterium gas, the temperature is going down. Okay. Now, we're going to see similar video clip of the similar experiments. Let's start the next video clip. But I would appreciate if you increase the voice because I'm going to talk there. My voice must be you, you, you may increase, okay? So the low energy nuclear fusion experiments... You may increase. ...including specimen. This is the view of the specimen. You can see... You see a little bit okay? This actually can give you a counter. The scale, the counter scale, this ammeter, the current of the current to the specimen, meter. this AC current, this is the voltage, the voltage, voltmeter, okay, and Here. three bubble detectors for neutron detection, with the bubble detectors for the so. neutron detection. The heating is provided by Auto transformer. Very simple circuit. Just actually barrier. Auto transformer barrier we used. By supply. And the deuterium gas is coming from this tank. To the pipelines. The valves are open. All of them through the gas cabinet. Here you can see the mass flow controls from pressure control of the injected gases. Then the gas injected in the main chamber. Here is the gas injection to these pipes. Here. And this is the tube where the in the special reaction chamber is attached. This is the, the gate. And the gate is open. This pyrometer over the window. You measure the temperature. Okay. You 
makes them. So, the control by camera, the, camera. the, the same camera actually and, uh, device are on computer screen. You know, for easy control. By this screen here is the current, the voltage okay. is here. The initial temperature is uh, about uh, 520 degrees C. As I mentioned, I will there comment. There is no gas in the chamber. There is no gas in the chamber. Only parasitic injected gas. Is there. You can see. What is in oxygen? And yeah. the current is 3.665667 amps. Voltage is 18.3 volts. This is actually initial showing the down of the gamma detectors. Okay. We can begin. Pay attention to the, the showing the parameter. Pedal couples are not in use now. This is a kind of information information which is actually There is injection gas is coming. This coming from this pipe green shows green lines show incoming tear gas. The temperature decreases because the actually tear gas begins cooling. Okay. And the specimen. We it have RJ confirmation about flowing to the tear gas. Here is the current in the voltage. Specimen. The temperature is already very low, uh, relatively low because about 55 degrees below the initial value because it's cooling. But now the temperature continue will begin rising. You see the green lines. You see already the around the main the center. One is the inlet, the other, the, other, the other one is outlet green line. Despite, however, the cooling, the temperature already increases. So already, already we having energy release in the specimen. We can see here. We can see the gas is in by the RGA. And we can see the voltage. The duration changed. The current duration changed. Almost the duration changed. The temperature is already 15, about 15 degrees above the initial value. Although the incoming butylene gas is cooling. The initial value was 520. These actually are the ejected gases. It is a gas injection. Chamber. This is the in the voltage. Even the kettle slightly decreased because the temperature is less than the increases. temperature is already more than about 35 degrees above the initial value despite initial gas is cool. This is inlet, this is outlet of the deuterium. Green lines show exactly these things. Temperature increases. It is about approximately 40 degrees above the initial value temperature. There is a flow of deuterium gas, which is cooling. Confirmed by the RGA of the gas in the main chamber. At the same time, we don't have significant change in the current. Even more, the current decreases. A little bit decreases, yes. Now, the temperature of the parameter is more than 40 degrees above initial value, although the ethereum gas is cooling. I would like to point your attention on this uh, value. Be careful now, what will happen Here we have the ethereum gas in the chamber. The ethereum gas will stop. Shorty, the ethereum gas, gas will stop. Gas, the temperature 
in increases. It is about 100 degrees above, more than 100 degrees above the initial value. You see the per thermometer temperature. At the same time, we have almost no change in the current in the load, even the current slightly decreases. This indication about gamma rays. We don't have gases in the chamber. Confirmed by the RGA. The temperature is about 50 degrees above the initial value. There is no flow of the gas in the chamber. There is no green light here, which means you don't have gas injection. The temperature remains about 50 degrees above the initial value. And the same time, the electrical current is slightly less than the initial value. This is actually indication of gamma rays. No gases in the chamber. Confirmed by the RJ. Only the bubbles sticking injecting gases are there. Okay. And the temperature is 45 degrees above the initial value. Even more. Another cycle is coming now. New cycle is coming. And you can... The video clip stops because actually uh, it will be a bit not exactly the same, but uh, uh, similar things. So I would like uh, we to return again to the main presentation. Okay, thank you. So now, let's go further. This is the view of the specimen after a lot of experiments. It means the experiments are not only replicable, but the specimen and its parameters remain the same after the experiments. You can see here. Okay. You can see here the change of the temperature. It is another experiment, not exactly the experiment uh, uh, shown on the video. On the video, the experiment was uh, initial temperature was 520 degrees C. Here we have 534 degrees C, and the temperature of the wire corresponds is 680 degrees C. You see here the red line giving the initial temperature coming from the heating. You see here now, this green line shows initial decrease of the temperature, which we already saw, uh, saw after it increase, and here, sharp increase of the temperature. It means in all experiments, we used to see in the beginning decrease of the, experiment, uh, the temperature, after it increase, stabilization of the temperature, and after stopping of the deuterium gas, the temperature jumps above. Here we have about 640 degrees. After it is go down, goes down, goes down. Another cycle is coming. Another, another reaction begins here. Stabilization of the uh, temperature. Stopping of the tear gas. Jump. The temperature is jumps. Is jumping up. Here we're having continuation of the reaction because of the absorbed deuterium gas. The same pertains here. Here the deuterium gas is dissolved already. And the temperature here pertains to the temperature mainly of the alumina rod, and etc. I would like to point your attention to the last cycle here. In fact, it shows small peak in comparison to the previous peaks. Uh, a possible explanation here is that we are having incorporation of certain atoms in the specimen, which cannot leave the specimen in these circumstances which means these atoms are not deuterium atoms. In order the specimen to be established and the new experiment to begin, we have to uh, 
apply some degassing process for three minutes. And after that, we can repeat exactly the same experiment. So now, the comments. This is the input power in watts. This is actually the initial temperature of the entire specimen in cells, uh, degrees Celsius. This is the initial temperature of the wires. Again, the Stefan Boltzmann law was used in order for the temperature of the wire to be distinguished from the temperature of the rod because the parameter measures the integral temperature of the entire specimen, including the wire and the rod. So now, the temperature of the rod was actually five indices we call in shows. Now, after the interaction, the temperature of the wire was determined to be over 1,000 in this actually four presented experiments here. The change of the temperature per specimen is shown here. You can see here, it's not exactly 400 degrees C. Okay, not exactly 400 degrees C, but it is actually close to 400 degrees C. And it happens for 30 seconds after the beginning of the injection. This is delta time for in injection. So now, here we're having the released power in watts. Close to 200 watts, a little bit less in certain experiment. Here we have density of the released power per gram of the constant on wire. Here, huge density. It cannot be afforded in turn by chemical reactions. And here we have the output power related to the input power. In the, my previous uh, presentation in uh, uh, this actually I, in the California conference, I considered here the release power, which means the same numbers minus one. But it's actually the output power versus input power. It's actually these things, four. So now, is it possible the release energy should be of electrical origin? No, because as we saw, the parameters of the heat and electrical circuit remain unchanged during the experiments. Is it possible the released energy to be of chemical origin? Well, it was determined that the burning of deuterium gas, giving deuterium oxide, this energy about 7.5 joules if all parasitic injected oxygen participates in the burning, which means it is 600 times less than the total released energy. Now, also the experiment showed that the energy release continues after the end of the deuterium injection, which actually release cannot be explained by a chemical reaction involving the deuterium. To avoid some speculation regarding uh, uh, breaking of the deuterium molecules, is it possible this energy to take place due to exothermic process caused by absorption or desorption of deuterium in the constant time? Well, in the circumstances this, in, in the experiments, if we assume that during the absorption we have increased the temperature, after that we have desorption. So it supposed to take the heat from the surrounding area. And if we consider actually the energy conservation law, the green area must be equal to the blue area. But as a matter of fact, I, want, I would like to go back you can see here, all of these actually peaks are above the green line, which is the initial temperature, which means that the, the energy is generated inside of the specimen. So now, the conclusion I made is that this energy coming from cold nuclear fusion reaction in the constant sun specimen. If somebody considers something else, he must consider that the Released energy doesn't have, sorry, uh, has some kind of unusual origin. Okay? And it is actually a relatively high density of released excess energy. By, and by helium release, discuss, uh, it is discussed in the temperature graph above and confirmed by the RJ. We have uh, 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 helium release, but it is subject of another presentation because actually during the experiments there is helium release in another part of the system.
So now, no radiation, gamma rays, and neutrons outside of the gas chamber was detected during the experiments. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer all your questions. Okay, so Dimitar, thanks for a very interesting talk. Just my question for me, one, uh, Dimitar, the diameter for your wire and length? Uh, the diameter of the wire was uh, about, uh, I think it is 0 0.4 millimeters diameter, and the length was about one meter. One meter? Yes. 0 0.4? 0 0.4 4 millimeter. Meter. Okay. Yes. Now, people. Um, I saw this process in January in Moscow in 2015. They used a compressed titanium pellet. Uh, Sergei Godin, you can ask him about it. They inductively heated the pellet and they passed the deuterium through and demonstrated multiple times the same kind of process cycling. Um, as I understand it, uh, the energy is sufficient to split the uh, hydrogen isotope into three components. The one that I'll talk about tomorrow, which is a cluster structure, the proton itself and the electrons. The electrons then condense into a coherent state around the cluster structure and the protons go on to that. In the process, they release the kinetic energy of the electrons. And then these are, can become neutral and they can go out of the reactor. So you do not have the, the temperature going up and then the temperature going down because it isn't in there anymore. It's gone no, away. No, the temperature so, remains above the, uh, the initial temperature as they demonstrated. Uh, yes, and the, the, the reason it occurred that you had the flash heating is because you went through a threshold at which this occurs extremely rapidly. The heat gets released extremely rapidly. It, gra it, it, it flash, um, you've got the boiling point, sorry, the melting point of copper at 1,080 something and your top temperature was 1064 when you started at the lower temperature. So I think you would easily exceed the threshold with the pressure. What is the pressure of the deuterium you're putting in? The, the pressure? Yeah. 0 0.1 or 0 0.1 atmosphere. Okay, so you're a low pressure, so it will boil yes. at a lower temperature. A little temperature. bit lower than the, the atmospheric pressure. Yeah, so, um, so the, the risk that you run is that um, they've determined that the radiation uh, goes out to 700 meters from the source. And so you need to protect yourself when you're running. I'll talk about the protection tomorrow. Okay. But it works. I, 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 I've seen it. We saw it in 2013 with Chalani wire, but at a lower degree. It was shown in Rossi's in 2011 and recorded by Francesco Chalani, seven meters using a scintillator because they bind into the photo sites of the scintillator. Okay. So this is a real phenomenon. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Other people? Paul, you? You have some questions? Oh, I'll answer the question. Okay. Other questions? Uh, by me? Oh, sorry. Could I ask what precautions you take to avoid the possibility of recombination of the deuterium with oxygen inside the reactor? Because uh, the temperature curve... Oxygen, oxygen was actually publicly injected, coming from the environment, from outside. Uh, so now, uh, of course, actually, if we can see... Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, this actually determination of the energies determined because of the burning. I assume that actually all oxygen participates in the burning of the deuterium. And all released energy goes exactly in the wire. Mm -hmm. Of course, it is not correct. But it works in favor of chemical release and chemical contributions to increase of the energy of the wire. It's not correct. So now, uh, even in this case, I shot, I don't remember exactly how much, I think 600 times is less than actually the measure to release energy after that. I ask particularly because um, oh, many years ago I was working in a, a biotechnology laboratory and we were growing anaerobic bacteria mm -hmm. and uh, we used to grow them in a hydrogen atmosphere and we would admit um, uh, hydrogen purge the chamber the, the, the growth chamber with, with hydrogen, and there was a little coil of uh, constant tan wire in the top, which was connected to a battery. And we used to, you just press the button, and uh, the, the wire would glow, and there would be a, a kind of catalytic reaction on the surface of the constant tan, where it, where it consumed any stray oxygen that was, that was in the chamber. And uh, I, I, I just wondered, do you, how do you purge the oxygen because it will stick to any surface? Or alternatively, do you ever see water vapor in your RGA? Uh, as a matter of fact, the oxygen was measured by RGA, 
And of course, the reduction of the pressure, because the RJ works uh, at low pressure in comparison with the pressure switch uh, I, uh, I'm working here, uh, the oxygen, uh, well, it, it was actually the real uh, uh, amount of the oxygen injected in the main chamber as parasitic in injection, mm -hmm. which uh, was measured by RGA, by the way. Okay. So, and again, I assume that everything is, uh, all oxygen burns, yes. which is okay. not realistic, in so fact, but I assume. Yes. Next question, please. People there. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> As a comparison, did you try uh, injecting other um, gas species, uh, hi of, hydrogen itself? Yes. Example. As a matter of fact, I uh, uh, repeated this uh, the same experiments with nitrogen. It doesn't have uh, uh, increase of the uh, the temperature. Hydrogen. Nitrogen. Oh, uh, 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 have I used hydrogen? No. Uh, I'm going to tell you why. I, uh, I, I ha I'm having plans, by the way, to use uh, uh, hydrogen in the experiments. Uh, however, uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm taking easy regarding involvement of the hydrogen uh, because uh, according to my point of view, I used to develop some theory. My point of view, yes, we can observe called nuclear fusion reaction using the nitrogen, but the yield of the energy will be low. It is my point of view. So maybe I will begin with mixture, deuterium, hydrogen, something like that, and to see if I can reach the optimal ratio between hydrogen and uh, deuterium, if optimal ratio can be found at all. I'm concerned, by the way. Yes? Huh? Sorry? You mix the deuterium with a small amount of xenon and try that. Sorry? Xenon. X-E. Xenon. 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 Oh, xenon. Oh. Yes, but what, do, what is the yeah. question? What is the question? Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Oh, other, uh, other gas. May I make the very heavy, stable uh, gas, xenon? Could you add that in your trials, please? Mm. Question for me is possible. I couldn't. Uh, uh, okay. Your question is uh, uh, did I find some. Uh, 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 no. I, 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 sorry. Uh, Vic, the point about xenon or argon or such heavy gases would be to decrease the thermal conductivity of the gas. So maybe it would change again this uh, wire temperature. The thermal conductivity to be used by, but why do I have to use these things? Why? I can change actually, uh, I can change. Okay, uh, so Ken Shoulders used xenon as his preferred heavy isotope gas. One, because it has a very low ionization energy, mm -hmm. so it can become part of the clusters that I believe that you are producing and also because it has a very large mass and mixed with the proton or deuteron, if you've got deuteron in there, it would be that case, the fission products inside the cluster will potentially yield far higher energies. So it's not for that reason, it's for the potential yield of energy. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. I have a question for you. Yes. First again, um, I don't understand if you check with helium gas, very easy, and moreover, how many times you can repeat the experiment before the wire break? How many times it can work before, because the weak Not point of wires, at, they break. So okay, uh, the wire actually, in this section, the second uh, set of the experiments didn't break at all. It didn't change at all. Uh, uh, but in the first set of the experiments, uh, the wire was completely new. And when actually the temperature was 950 degrees, about 950 degrees, it used to break right away. I, 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 for this set of, of, of experiments, I didn't uh, use this wire before. For no experiments, just, just actually new specimen, new uh, alumina rod with uh, uh, the corresponding turns coiled around this one here. And it, break, it used to break right away. So it means it can be built a engine based on this principle because the wire didn't break. Could you repeat your question no. again? 
because the wire was not broken after the experiment, you can make cycles several hundred times or so more. Uh, how many times you can repeat the, the cycle? This experiment? Yes. Oh, a lot of times with the same. Uh, uh, if it with is the not same the, wire, with the, the same wire, the same wire, a lot of experiments, many, 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 many experiments. Okay. And and I sh I uh, uh, used to show you the. I'm going to show again the view of the of uh, of the things uh, of, of the view of the wire after a lot of experiments. You see now, I'm going to show you the, these things. This is actually the view uh, after a lot of experiments. You see, it is like new specimen. Nothing happens here. And we observed exactly the same things which we saw on the two video clips. Exactly the things, the same things. Okay. So it means it means something like that. This thing, this technology, by the way, can be used for in, in the design of new energy source because it may work continuously. Something like that. Okay, so I think thanks a lot. The next speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. The next speaker is Montagnoli from Turin University. The argument of Montagnoli is um, fractal emission uh, problematics. Typical work of Professor Carpinteri. Okay. Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon to everyone. I am uh, Francesco Montagnoli, a postdoc researcher at Politecnico di Torino. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the application of neutron emissions measurements for the seismic forecasting and, um, and a new and promising structural health monitoring technique for components subjected to cyclic loadings. So, in the last 15 years, a large amount of experimental data has been collected at the Politecnico di Torino about acoustic, electromagnetic, and neutron uh, emissions from solid media su subjected to... Sorry. Brittle. No, Sub subjected to brittle fracture. So, according to the theoretical model proposed by Professor Carpinteri, the brittle failures of solid, solids produce a rapid emission of energy involving the generation of pressure waves that travel at a characteristic speed with an order of magnitude of 1,000 meters per second. Therefore, according to this... Sorry. Okay. According to this simple relationship, a, um, a relationship between the crack size and the frequency of the phonons can be obtained. In other words, a fracture at the nanoscale emits pressure, oh, thank you. Okay. emits pressure uh, waves at the frequency scale of terahertz, and at the same time, uh, pressure waves with frequencies in the gigahertz and megahertz uh, may trigger the emissions of electromagnetic and acoustic emissions, respectively. So, it can be summarized that terahertz pressure waves or phonons produced by the mechanical instability can induce low energy nuclear reactions and then neutron emissions. Based on this observation, um, 
uh, this observation, three different forms of energy, acoustic emissions, electromagnetic emissions, and neutron emissions may be use, used as earthquake precursors for uh, environmental protection against the seismicity. To this aim, an in-situ monitoring campaign has been started since uh, July uh, 2013 and uh, in a, uh, at a gypsum mine located in uh, northern Italy. And then by using a dedicated instrumentation located at 100 meters below the ground level was used in order to assess the seismicity of the surrounding area. During this period, more or less uh, 500 earthquakes and 63 seismic swarms occurred during this period. After that, by means of an appropriate multimodal statistic analysis, it was uh, investigated the temporal correlation between the three fractal emissions, acoustic, electromagnetic, and neutron emissions, and the incoming earthquakes. So, in this slide, I have reported the earthquakes occurred during the first semester of uh, 2017. And with the, this black curve, you can see the results of the, um, of the statistical, multimodal statistical analysis. You can see here f five peaks, each peak corresponds to a seismic swarm. Similar multimodal analysis was carried out for the three different forms of energy, the acoustic emissions, the electromagnetic emissions, and finally, for the neutron emissions. After that, a temporal correlation between the three, these three different forms of energy and um, seismic activity was carried out. Here, you can see the temporal correlation between the seismic, seismic swarm with the black car and the acoustic emission. From this figure, it emerges how the acoustic emissions tend to forerun the next major earthquake of about more or less uh, one day. The electromagnetic emissions tend to forerun the seismic swarm of about three or four days, and finally, the neutron emissions tend to follow around the next major earthquake of about one week. Then, by concluding this uh, first part of my presentation, we can summarize that the acoustic emission, the three different forms of energy, uh, were analyzed by means of a multimodal statistical analysis, and uh, um, the experimental uh, showed uh, a strong correlation between the three different forms of energy and the earthquakes occurred in the surrounding areas. Finally, the acoustic emissions, the electromagnetic emissions, and the neutron emissions tend to anticipate the next seismic swarm peak with a shifting of about one day, sorry, three days, and one week for these three different forms of energy. Now, let's move on to the, the second part of my presentation. Uh, this part was developed uh, thanks to the, the, the European project, Clean HME, and based on the previous observation, we decided to apply the neutron emission measurements uh, in the fatigue early diagnosis of metallic material. First of all, a brief introduction about uh, the Fatigue phenomenon is needed. So according to the definition given by the American Society for Testing and Materials, the, sorry, the fatigue can be defined as a permanent, progressive, and localized process of structural change in a material that is subjected to uh, stress, uh, uh, mechanical stresses. And these mechanical stresses can lead to the formation of cracks and fracture of a sufficient number of cycles. In the, the present experimental campaign, it was used an ultrasonic fatigue testing machine. Here you can see the main components of an ultrasonic testi fatigue testing machine. First of all, we have this ultrasound generator, which uh, uh, provides an electric signal uh, with a frequency of 20 kilohertz. Therefore, we have the uh, converter, the, the piezoelectric transducer, 
uh, in this way, the uh, electric signal uh, is converted in a mechanical vibration with the same frequency, 20 kilohertz, about 20 kilohertz. Then we have a booster and horn. The aim of the horn is to magnify the mechanical vibration provided to the specimen. Here you can see, in this image, the ultrasonic generator uh, of the ultrasonic testing machine that was used in this experimental campaign. And at the same time, here, you can see the uh, mechanical component of the ultrasonic testing machine, the piezoelectric transducer, the booster, the arm, and finally here we have the specimen. The fatigue tests were carried out uh, under fully reversed constant stress amplitude tension compression condition, and according to the uh, working principle of the ultrasonic fatigue testing machine, the test is automatically stopped when the specimen frequency falls da fall down 19.5 kHz. In this experimental campaign, the specimens were tested up to failure or up to 10 billion cycles. Then, in order to investigate the specimen size effects, or both on the fatigue resistance and the neutron, in the neutron emissions, five different sets of aluminum alloy samples were tested. The diameters in the middle cross-section were 3, 6, 12, 24, and 30 millimeters. Here you can see the uh, experimental results. So the stress range applied is plotted against the number of cycles to failure. So um, here you can see uh, the influence of specimen size effects. I mean, by increasing the specimen size, the fatigue resistance decreases. But at the same time, you can see a transition between small scale, where the size effects is uh, evident, and larger scales, where the size effects is vanishing. This uh, transition can be explained by adopting the multifractal model, which was proposed by Professor Alberto Carpinteri two decades ago. Then, during the fatigue test, a uh, few samples were uh, monitored with the, uh, this uh, um, setup, this experimental setup, by adopting this uh, neutron detector. Uh, so here you can see the neutron detector, here we have the, the um, electronic of pre-amplification amplification and discrimination directly connected to the detector tube and uh, the sensitivity of uh, the detector tube was equal to a, um, a flux of uh, uh, one thermal neutron per second and square centimeters. Centimeter, sorry. Now, here you can see the counts, count rate for the smaller, smallest specimen, 3 millimeters, which is, was subjected to a stress range of 420 megapascal. Uh, of course, before the fatigue tests, the, um, the background measurements were performed uh, for more or less two, two hours, and with this circle, you can see the background level, which was equal to 6 point times 10 to minus 2 CPS. About the, these results, you can see these five different peaks. And this value is more or less uh, three times, four times the background, more or less. And in terms of uh, cumulative neutron emissions, at the end of the test, an increment equal to 57.5% was found with respect to the natural background level. After that, the influence of the stress range, the mechanical stress range uh, on the uh, neutron emissions were investigated. Uh, probably the main important uh, issue is this one. For the highest stress range, we found the highest neutron emission. But in general, we can, we can uh, see uh, an increment in the neutron emission with the stress range. 
about the results obtained for the specimen of 6 millimeters. In this case, the stress range was 380 megapascal. Uh, so, in this case, the main important issue is that after more or less 1,800 seconds from the beginning of the test, we found an increment in the neutron emission activity. In terms of cumulative neutron emissions, an increment equal to 21.8% was found uh, with respect to the natural background. And in particular, here you can see also this deviation from the natural background. Again, the influence uh, of the stress range on the uh, cumulative neutron emissions, emissions was investigated. And again, the highest value in the neutron emission was found for the highest stress range. Then we have the, the results obtained for the specimen of 12 millimeters. In this case, the stress range was equal to 320 megapascal. Um, okay. In this case, an increment in the neutron activity was found after 1,200 seconds from the beginning of the test with this uh, more or less six peaks. And in particular, you can see here, so at, uh, when the ultrasonic testing machine switches off, the neutron activity decreased to the natural background level. Okay? When the ultrasonic testing machine switches off, it means that we have the sample failure. In terms of cumulative neutron emission, in this case, an increment equal to 18.1 was found. Again, the, the, here you can see the neutron emission as a function of the stress range. In this case, unfortunately, the highest value in the neutron emission activity was not found for the highest stress range. But also in this case, more or less, you can see uh, an increasing, uh, in the, in, an increment in the neutron emission activity with the stress range. Now, we uh, consider the uh, specimen of 24 millimeters. In this case, the stress range uh, that was applied is equal to almost 300 uh, megapascal. In this case, we have a significant uh, a neutron emission, in particular at the end of the test, when we have the sample failure with a peak, uh, with a peak equal to uh, two times the natural background level. In terms of cumulative neutron emission, in this case, a value equal to 22.2% was found. Again, the influence uh, of the stress range in the neutron emission activity was found. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, for the highest stress range, it was found the uh, lowest value in the neutron emission activity. And probably uh, more uh, investigations are needed, more samples to test are needed. Finally, we have the results obtained for the largest specimen, 30 millimeters in diameter, millimeters. In this case, uh, unfortunately, uh, the neutron measurements yielded to values very comparable with the background uh, level, with the ordinary natural background. In other words, this uh, fluctuation may be due to uh, the uh, natural, uh, ordinary fluctuations of the background level. In fact, also in terms of cumulative neutron, uh, uh, neutron emission, uh, cumulative, sorry, neutron emissions, a very small value was found, 3%, nothing. And these results were obtained also by increasing the specimen size. So a possible uh, reason of this, uh, this uh, very small uh, uh, neutron emissions, uh, probably two possible reasons. The first one 
is uh, due to the anisotropic and uh, uh, anisotropy of the um, of the neutron em emission from a specific zone of the, the samples. I mean, probably more than one uh, detector tube could be placed around the samples. Probably because uh, if the crack occurs uh, in the opposite side with respect to the detector tube, of course, uh, the neutron emission uh, acquired is uh, very low. At last but not least, the influence of size effects on the neutron emission activity was investigated. Uh, in this uh, figure, we have five curve, curves. Each curve is uh, uh, related to a fixed value of the stress range. So, uh, in this case, you can see an increment in the neutron emission activity by increasing the specimen size for a fixed stress range. Um, this uh, observation, this experimental observation, is uh, consistent with the experimental evidence that very large specimens are characterized by a very brittle fracture and then uh, are characterized with a very uh, strong emission of neutron emission. Now, by concluding my presentation, New, during the uh, fatigue test, neutron emissions were detected uh, with respect to the natural background, and in particular, the most significant deviation was found for the smallest specimens, but with, which, sub, which, which was subjected to the highest stress range, whereas the lowest neutron emissions were found for the largest specimens, but which was subjected to the lowest stress range. Finally, it was observed that the larger is the specimen size, the larger results to be the neutron emission activity. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay. Um, I have, sorry, I have a immediate question. <laughs> if I, I see well, you have just a bare neutron detector. It means you can detect only um, thermal neutrons. Yes. So why don't you use a typical paraffin or polyethylene detector to moderate the high energy neutrons? <laughs> okay. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, so the, the um, thermal neutrons was uh, uh, considered... Uh, Signature? The, yes. Of, okay. Uh, of, due to the brittle fracture of the samples. Okay. Possibility. Okay. Some other people question. Thank you for your presentation. If you wish to to detect uh, to predict uh, uh, earthquakes uh, with uh, this. Uh, check over the neutron and uh, other kind of uh, emission, uh, which is the, the sensitivity of, of the method. I mean, uh, you measured everything in, in the mine, but uh, you, you have always to, to do this uh, like this, or you, you can try to, to study the phenomenon uh, in a different environment. And the, sorry, the second question is, uh, it depends strongly on the characteristic, on the features of the rocks. I, this is not uh, for a seismic... Uh, yeah, record. yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, in, in this case, the sensitivity of the instrument was, uh, again, uh, one thermal neutron per second uh, per, uh, per square centimeters. In this case, uh, about the second question, uh, in this case, uh, the, the detector tube was placed in a gypsum mine. Uh, probably, yes, it uh, depends on the characteristic of the rock, but... Um. Uh, it's well known that if you change the stress on some quartz, you can get electric, very high electric fields. And I wonder if these electric fields could be responsible for neutron production by some kind of accelerating of the uh, charged particles in the, more, in the rock. So 
In, in, uh, for the fat fatigue uh, test, the elect electromagnetic noise uh, was, uh, was accounted. In particular, before the fatigue test, the electronic uh, devices were switched on, okay? And uh, neutron emission uh, activity was measured. Here, you can see here the gray curve. The gray curve is uh, the neutron emission activity with the electronic devices switched off, switched on. Uh, the black curve, the, sorry, the black curve, sorry. The gray curve is the neutron background. So in this case, we have, we had the very similar results. So in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the electronic spice due to electronic devices uh, uh, is not accounted in this case. I have a question. Um, I think your measurement of the background is not correct because sometimes you have zero neutrons during the experiment, uh, which is lower than the background, so it doesn't make really sense. Yeah, it, it, okay, it was due to the uh, discretization time, so I mean, oh, oh. sorry. Okay. No, before. We, uh, just, okay, but it's the same. No, again, before that, yeah. Okay, so of course, we actually we measured the uh, cumulative neutron counts, then in order to obtain the, uh, the, um, the count rate, we uh, consider a discretization time, and then we uh, evaluate the neutron counts in this, uh, in this uh, discretization yeah, time. Yeah, but you should measure the counts the same way for the background and for the active material. Yes, sure, but... But it's not the case, because sometimes you have less of the background, it doesn't make sense. You should always have the background. It should be always above the background within the air bars. Yes, above or... Yeah, in so it should be... But this has to be corrected, you know, that's all. <laughs> yes, before. Yeah. Yes, it, it, the, back, the background is an average value, of course. Yeah, that's, that's because correct. we add only one detector, and yeah. then we... Uh, yes. <laughs> so yes, I understand the your question, is too but flat. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, you should show that. So, if no other question, we can close the session, and the letter will be in the general assembly of our. Sorry. No. 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 The program is now. <laughs>
a meeting whereby the, the members of the society uh, hear the reports of the officers, like, such as myself, I'm the chief executive, and uh, in addition, uh, had sufficient notice been given, you could, you could uh, make proposals um, for, for discussion. And uh, these proposals could be of a legal nature, like um, uh, dismissing all the officers, for example, or electing new ones. <laughs> But no one, no one has ever come up with a proposal in the, in the last um, 15 years. Uh, so it's really up, it's really up to, uh, to us um, to decide what should be discussed. Uh, because the International Society is a, a charity, our objectives are to serve the public, not just the members. It is extremely important. And this is why this meeting is open to everybody, whether you're a member or not. Because we want to publicize what we do. So uh, my report today is to, well, I've just explained some of the objectives, but I will go into that in more detail. Uh, I will discuss the financial results for the last two years. Um, then the, I will talk about the, uh, the medals which the uh, society awards. I'm going to propose um, that we suspend membership fees. I hope that everyone, that will make people happy. And uh, I want to ask you all about what is the preferred payment method when you, for example, you have to pay your uh, workshop fees, for example. We used to use this, uh, the uh, PayPal also for um, uh, paying membership dues, but if we're going to abolish them, we don't need that anymore. And finally, uh, Jean-Paul will, will make a presentation on the proposed reorganization of the electronic journal. So, uh, I've, uh, for the objectives, I've merely copied some of the, uh, the clauses. I don't know if you can read that, it's fairly small. Yes, you probably can. Um, the objectives from the, the Constitution of the Society. I'm not going to bother to read them out, but they're, uh, I think they rather comprehensively cover what we're actually doing. We organize meetings, of course. Uh, we, we haven't carried out any research, but perhaps from time to time we encourage groups to, to get together. Uh, we might advise um, industry for, uh, and provide consultancy. In practice, we haven't done that on a society basis, but perhaps we have on an individual basis. Anyway, I'm not going to go on with that anymore. Let's, let's pass on to the next um, item. I wonder how many people know their Latin. What does the ISUNS motto mean? Ardec, Ardet nec consumita. Can anyone remember? Because I think I told this, I presented this some 15 years ago. No, no, I'm not going to change it. It's not from you. It's not protected, this. This what? Is this not a deposit to the cash bar? No, 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 no. Because this is a trade where from the Bible. From the Bible, exactly. What it actually means, literally, is it burns, but is not consumed. And I think this encapsulates the, the spirit of cold fusion. We have a source of excess energy, which we cannot explain, because we haven't identified the fuel yet. Anyway. Oh, I've got the answer there already. So now I'm going to pass on to the uh, finances. And I'm comparing the two years, 2020 with 20. 2020 with 2021, and we made a loss last year, mainly because of COVID, we had no um, substantial meeting. Uh, sorry, in 2010, 2020, when COVID started. Last year, we did have a, a meeting, and that generated a small profit. And the, the net result is an increase in our effectively cash assets to very nearly 20,000 um, uh, euros, which is quite a good war chest, I think, especially as in the future we're going to have some greater expenses. Um, what about taxes? Well, we're a non-profit society, a charity in the English law, 
and that means we don't pay any corporation taxes, and we also don't pay any value-added tax, which means this is one of the reasons why we can provide these very cheap workshops. In the past years, I've spoken about a so-called charitably incorporated organization, which is a new uh, legal structure for the, for, for the possible structure for the society under English law. I'm not quite so enthusiastic about this conversion idea anymore for two reasons. One is that uh, UK, the UK is no longer in, in the European Union. And that means we might, if we consolidate ourselves in the UK, we might find ourselves excluded from uh, research projects such as which the Euro European Union finances. So we might want to think in the medium term of actually reconstituting the society in a different country. Uh, the second reason is that uh, the UK has become much less bureaucratic, maybe as a result of Brexit. No, it's not quite true. <laughs> and consequently, a lot of the advantages which would have accrued by being the charitably incorporated organization no longer apply. So I think it's best to do nothing until um, the, 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 a new leadership, uh, the, a new members make a proposal to, to move to a different country. I would suggest, however, if we do that, uh, it should not be America, because Americans already dominate most of science, and it should be an English-speaking country. It, we could purely, for example, um, choose um, the island of Malta, for example, which is English-speaking and is in the European Union. And it's a lovely place to, to have a conference. <laughs> I was suggesting that it might be appropriate, but it, it's, it's not a proposal, that we should, the, the, the international society could migrate to another country. Where it, I, I mentioned the island of Malta. Well, yes, for example, because it's English speaking and it's in the European Union. And it's a nice place to, to have meetings. <laughs> uh, going back to financial objectives, um, Back in 2013, we set the, uh, an objective as to, was, which was to accumulate 20,000 euros in, as a kind of war chest. And that this would support poss possible failures of, of uh, organizing uh, workshops like this. You, you might find that uh, another COVID plague hits us and we have to cancel everything and we would owe a lot of money to the hotel and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, ob it's obviously a risky enterprise to organize any workshop, and so this cushion of money would, would help against that. It would also mean that um, we can pay, pay our bills without having to worry about where the, where the next money is coming from. So, uh, for example, the publication of the, of the journal it often makes um, demand, unexpected demands, this as far as I'm concerned, which we can obviously supply immediately by having uh, this, this financial cushion. Uh, one of the objectives of the society is to involve people. Um, so uh, we will be interested in recruiting younger people who have good English skills, maybe good IT skills for certain tasks. They understand something about administration. They have, let's say, a, an entrepreneurial outlook. So someone who is self-employed, for example, would be a suitable person. And, uh, you need an appreciation of the science, even if you're not actually a scientist. So, uh, if you fancy stepping up to do some voluntary work, um, we'd like to hear from you. Um, because we are a, a charity and therefore take advantage of the, the tax breaks available for charities, there's a certain amount of regula uh, regulation and bureaucracy involved. The, uh, the major bodies regulating the society. Our company's house, which in other countries are probably known as the uh, uh, chambers of commerce, where you register companies, and they make quite sure that you deposit your, uh, your balance sheet and other financial information. And because we're in addition, in addition to being a company, we're also a charity, we also get some oversight and regulation from the Charities Commission which is a very good thing. It keeps people in moral order, shall we say. There's always a threat 
that you might find your, 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 your financial affairs investigated, or someone could complain, and uh, if they thought that someone was misusing the, the charity's funds, and uh, so they're, they act as a kind of regulator. And then, of course, the third one is uh, Her Maj His Majesty's Revenue and, and Customs, which is the, the tax authority in the UK. And we have a letter from them saying, we don't have to file any accounts or, or other information with them and, and uh, without a, a particular request. And again, it's extremely unlikely, I think, there would be such a request. After all, our turnover is very modest. Um, so, now on to medals. Um, at the, the last meeting in uh, California at ICCF 24, we awarded the second ever Toyota uh, gold medal, named after the founder of the Toyota family in Japan. And this was awarded to Ed Storms. And it's a, the previous medal had been awarded in 2009, I think. So 13 years ago to Martin Fleischmann, at the, at the Rome conference many years ago. So I think, I think Ed was, was really happy to receive a medal. And he, if, I think he felt promoted to the level of Martin Fleischmann. And it, it made the old man, he's, he's in his 90s, really happy, I think. He came to uh, ICF 24 particularly to receive the medal. I don't think he would have come otherwise. In addition, uh, for the... For, more lowly, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> for, for those who haven't risen to, to Martin Fleischmann's level quite yet, we've just had minted uh, 25 new Juliana Preparata medals. And I think I showed you a picture of this at my opening address. And this medal will be awarded at the, uh, the Gala Dinner tomorrow evening. I have to say, the new medals look a little bit better than the old ones. They're slightly bigger and heavier. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay, I have already mentioned the, uh, the possibilities of membership dues and fees. I don't think the society is particularly rich, but we are a going concern. I think in the long term, medium term, we are accumulating some funds, which is uh, very reassuring, I think, for everybody. But in order to encourage membership growth, particularly among younger people, it's proposed to abolish membership fees completely. Those are at uh, 30 euros a year, and quite honestly, it takes a lot of effort to chase people up, and uh, quite on it's not a good use of, of our time. So to reduce bureaucracy and to make everybody not feel guilty anymore about not paying, and I think there are quite a few people here who haven't paid, <laughs> we're going to abolish it completely. And we'll make our money, we'll make our income from workshops like this. And from donations, of course. So, the next question is, I would like to, I would like to hear your opinion about how to pay um, for, for workshops and conferences that we organize or for buying books and so on. At the moment, or rather for the last 15 years or so, we've been using PayPal. And even with the discounts available to charities, we're still paying about 2 or 3% in charges, which is a lot of money. I, assuming that we've spent, let's say, 100,000 euros over the last, well, much more than that, actually, uh, over the last so many years, 2 or 3% of 100,000 is a lot of money, actually. It would pay for quite a few students to attend a workshop, and we're just throwing it away. So I think um, it might be a good idea, and I want to hear your opinion, please, um, to, to use... Um, uh, bank transfers. Yes, we could do that. But let's say we could encourage the use of bank transfer because it would reduce bank charges. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yes, yes, that's okay. Uh, but I would like to hear from you which method you prefer. Yes, Bob. Exactly what we've got. We, we have it already. I've already done it. Yeah. And the, the, the details are on the website, so you could have paid for this conference using the WISE account. Okay. 
Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, the, que the question I'm asking you is, apart from Demita, do you actually appreciate using PayPal? It might be more convenient for a non-European, for example, like yourself, uh, to, to have to use PayPal. Oh, yes. And that's fine. Let's say bank information will be PayPal, let's say like uh, credit cards. Uh, like credit cards, like actually bank uh, checking account or saving accounts. If you don't feel comfortable to be in the PayPal uh, account only in this way, you can use, uh, it's my advice, my, my opinion, you can use uh, bank transfer. But otherwise, I feel comfortable, I found all the time that PayPal is a very secure way in the corresponding information, bank information to be kept, or credit card information to be kept, individual, in this actually uh, PayPal account, and I'm using PayPal account all the time. Even I prefer to use PayPal in all cases when I can use it. Okay? So that's why my uh, suggestion is okay, PayPal and bank transfer. Very good. delays. Oh yes, it has happened because PayPal is, is itself extremely bureaucratic. They change their rules and regulations every six months and it's, it's, it's really boring to have to check to see if you, if, uh, what, what has changed as regards the society. But it's happened to, to us that someone has, someone has paid uh, the society a lot of money and then PayPal decide, oh no, you need to provide some more information because you've exceeded some threshold of, of turnover or something like that. And then you find you can't pay your bills because the entire account has been frozen. And that's embarrassing, to be quite honest. So that, that's, that's the explanation of the delays. There might be a delay of several months. You know, when, 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 when I have to pay, um, for example, the, the copy setting fee for the journal, or I have to pay a deposit for a, a workshop, it's rather embarrassing not to be able to pay. I think it's very appropriate to go with the bank tra transfers if it means two or three percent. No, the bank transfers are 0 0.1 percent. No, yeah, but it's... To, to save the money, I think so to too. To save the money. Exactly. And the money could be put to better use, for instance, exactly. Even students. Though, it, Do we need younger people in this organization? Two or three percent seems like a very small fee, but over the, the decades, it accumulates to quite a large fee, actually. Two to three thousand a year. Yeah, something, well... <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the next topic. Oh, I think I've come to the end, that's good. Uh, because I'm going to pass over for no more questions and discussions to uh, Jean-Paul Biberion. Are there any general comments you'd like to make about the running of the society? So the PayPal remains? Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, I need uh, Emanuele. It's a, po a oh, pointer yeah. and a slide. Uh, Thank you. Uh, which is the name? Is this presentation of the journal? Okay. okay, all right. So let me give you a little bit of background of the journal. Well, in, um, at, at ICCF 10 in 2003, in September, it was decided to create a, a society, the International Society on Condensed Matter and Nuclear Science, and also to create a journal, the Journal of Condensed Matter and Nuclear Science, 
Um, so we have do been doing that for since uh, 2004, three, but it took a few years to get started. Now we have published 36 vol 35 volumes. Number 36 will be coming out very soon. That's the proceedings of the ICCF 23. It will come in a few days. Anyway, um, the problem is that this journal, I am in charge of this journal, and uh, everything is done out of my personal computer. And all the files are there in my computer. And um, the day I go for some reason, whatever, you know, who knows? It will happen one day anyway, so we have to prepare for the future. Uh, that day, uh, everything will be lost, unless someone can come in my computer and find out, understand what's happening. So we, with Steven Katinsky, we had the idea of going to something more professional. And especially maybe you have seen it when you go to a volume, like a, a volume, you have the whole volume at once. You don't have one paper one by one. By one. So it's much more convenient to have the paper you want and not the whole volume. So that will be made. So we found a company called Scholastica. And uh, these people are specialized in doing publishing journals. Scholastica. Open access journal. It's really free. We want to make the information on cold fusion as free as possible. Okay, it's an open access public platform. There is a peer review system. Obviously, we already have it, so we will use it that place. They have also a typesetting service, but um, we want to continue with the service we have at the moment. Uh, for, since the beginning of the journal, we use the services of Dr. Kumar. Unfortunately, Dr. Kumar died a couple of years ago because of COVID. He was very efficient, very, very good. So we lost quite a few months trying to find someone to replace him. Couldn't find anyone. And uh, paying the services of typesetting is expensive in the West. And finally, the son of Dr. Kumar, Ashwin Kumar, took over the, the job, so just like the queen and the son of the queen or something like that. I don't know, maybe generations of uh, editors. Anyway, so that we have someone doing the job. He's not as good as his father, but he's improving quickly. So we continue with him. So the typesetting will be done in India with Mr. Ashwin Kumar, and um, the edition will be, the publication will be on Scholastica. So it's a professional journal platform. Uh, there's all the efficiency of the professional system. It will be more efficient for following the papers, you know, because when I receive papers, it's just always a mess because some people answer with another title, so it's, it could be complicated. But this year it will be much easier. We all dealt with on their website. And it will be easier when I will pass over to someone else who wants to take care of the journal, for someone who has free time, like me, who can do that. I have spent a lot of free time, so it's okay. Um, well, so this is just BS. <laughs> um, this is their, their website, and it's not by writing. Um, so that's all right, I skip that one too. Uh, okay, now what about the cost? Um, it would cost us at almost $1,200 a year for the platform, plus 250 per year and $10 per subscription, submission. So if we publish like uh, 50 papers, that give 500, that's to be less than $2,000 per year as operation. So I think we have, so far, we have enough funding to, to work for two years, where you have some, some people gave money for that journal. So we have enough to, to, to work for two years. And after that, we have to find $2,000, euros, or pounds, whatever, per year. I think the, there are people ready to help us, I think. Either the society will do it or we'll ask for help from donations. I think that would not be a very problem. There's always the solution of charging people for publication, but I hate to do that. That increases the bureaucracy that I don't like. So I like donations more than something to pay. I like to have the 
income tax on a donation basis, but they don't want to listen to me in the governments. But you know, one day maybe it will happen. Anyway, um, what else do I say? So these are all the volumes that have been published. Some are missing, no? Huh? Another page? Well, well. Anyway, there are plenty of journals. The first volume was published in 2007, and on a regular basis, we publish two or three volumes a year now. And we have altogether maybe 400 papers. And our impact factor, for those who want to know, for their career, impact factor is two. So it's pretty low, but uh, we hope to go up the scale, especially if you publish in other journals and you, you put references in the Journal of Condensed Matter Nuclear Science. That will help. So I encourage you to publish in uh, two. It's, not, it's better than zero. Yeah, it's a lot of progress. <laughs> two is good. Yeah, we're not at the level of nature, but uh, we're getting close. <laughs> And, uh, but if you publish, the, the idea would be that you publish in a, another, another journal, and then you can publish a lo longer paper in the GSCMNS because we don't have a page limit there. So you can go into details that you cannot put in a uh, rev letters. Fees rev letters are only pa four pages, so you are limited in what you're going to write. But here you can put it as long as you want. It's cheap, I mean free, no printing costs. So, this is it. What's that? Oh, yeah. The thing is, you can see we will download one paper after the other. So you can pick the paper you want to download. But this, uh, this is set up, you will see later. So we are ready now to, to go online. So in a, maybe in one month from now, you will get all the volumes online and you will be able to download all the papers you want to do. Okay. If you, are, if you agree to pay 2000 a year, it's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You agree? Good. A question. Thank you very much for that. But how does this peer reviewing uh, system work? Oh, same as today. It means? It means that when I receive a paper, I send it to a specialist. When I receive a paper, I send it to a referee who knows the subject. I mean, if it's a theoretical paper, I send it to a theoretician. If it's a technical paper, I send it to someone technical. And um, what I want to do when I do that, I mean, I am in a position where I like to have the papers improved by the referee and not rejected by the referee, you know? So that is what we have been doing for since the very first day. So most of the papers have been improved a lot. Also, the English is rewritten by Jed Roswell. Each, pa each per paper written by non-native language in English, they are rewritten by, corrected, let's say. It doesn't rewrite, it corrects it. And um, if there is a problem with a referee, I, use, I take a second referee. I never went to three referees, I think, but uh, maybe I did once. Uh, if there is a discussion that's endless and uh, the referee wants to reject the paper and the author doesn't want it to be rejected, is I, as I am a peaceful person, I don't want to go to war with anyone. I don't want to have enemies, let's say. So I send it to a second referee and the opinion, then we decide what happens. You know. So that's the way it goes. So it will be the same thing. Is that the standard uh, method for, for re peer reviewing of oh, scientific yeah. paper? It's always like that. Sometimes they send it to two or three referees, depending on the journals. Yeah, depending on the journals. They send it to one and two, three, depends. That's very, very, very variable. Okay. Up to now, the referee system, politics, you select, I think it's almost ideal. The referee helps the researcher. So don't change this uh, very wise politics. In our case, we have, uh, okay, you know, very yes. compact paper, and after referee say, 
the tales, the tales increased from 12 to 35 pages. But the people now can understand what I mean. So, <laughs> yes, yes, I have my, my limits. Okay. So, uh, your uh, politics to have a um, collaborative referee, I think, has to be copied from other uh, journals. So, thanks, <laughs> Thank you. Bibliana. No, you know, there are two, three people, two, three authors that are headaches for me, you know? Oh, okay. Only two, you are one of them. I don't name the other ones. <laughs> you know your, your case. <laughs> I won't say who are the other ones. There are a few that really are headaches, you know. But most of the time it's okay, you know. But uh, yeah, a few I know. When the paper arrives, I oh, know another one like that. <laughs> it's <been my> <laughs> it will be a headache. <laughs> would, so it's would, quite time consuming anyway, so. Would you plan to, con uh, to continue the practice of publishing the papers from the ICCF and maybe from this? Yeah. Uh, from this conference as well? Yeah, since ICCF 16, we publish all the, re the proceedings in the journal. The f before that, at the, in the early days of cold fusion, there was no referees. Everything was published, good or bad, everything was published. And then when we arrived at ICCF 16, and we realized it's printing on paper is expensive, time consuming, I mean, it takes a lot of time, costs a lot of money to ship it and things like that. So we decided to go all electronic and uh, now we like electronic anyway. So now it will be like that. So ICCF 24 will be published also. So if you have papers you want to publish from ICCF 24, I was waiting to have the system established, but it takes time. So maybe you can send it to me and then I will put it back on the system, on the new system as soon as, I, as it's ready to go. Any other question? I can kill you with my... <laughs> no, this one. Yeah, Bill. I would just like to say thank you, John Paul, for his incredible work over the last 15 years. <laughs> I, I've always described the journal as the jewel in the crown of, of ISUNS. It makes the society uh, very popular. Uh, a lot of people down there the papers who have nothing to do with the society at themselves. And it's all thanks to you, Jean-Paul. Thank you very much. You should, send you should send flowers to my wife, you know? She will be happy. <laughs> it's very time consuming, actually, you know. When I see the proceedings of a job, you know, it's very time consuming. But anyway, it's interesting job. At least I have a title, Editor-in-Chief. Can you imagine that? I'm a chief. <laughs> At the end of my career, <laughs> make any sense? Okay, any other question? Otherwise, we break up. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good dinner. <laughs> At seven thirty. Seven thirty. Okay. Are you tomorrow morning? Uh, yes, 11.30. Okay.